I'd like to call up our other panelists, please. Um, Katie Daigle, she's deputy news editor for Science News. Rajesh Mirchandani, chief communications officer at the UN Foundation and a former journalist with the BBC. And Lucy Biggers, you know Lucy from earlier today. She's the now this sustainability producer. So have a seat. So, so I, last year at our summit, some of you were here, we had um, the climate desk editor uh, for the New York Times. The New York Times has started a climate desk. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask you, um, and, and let's start, Katie, with you, because you're, you've been a journalist. You were at the AP before. You're, you've been at Science News how long now? A year. Just a year. Yeah. And before that, you were at the AP. About 17 years. And you were around the world with them. Yes. Covering globally. this and other things. You're also on the board of the... Society of Environmental Journalists. I like it when she's great said. organization. If you want to get into right, and, and we're going to be doing more with them. I hope too in the future. Is the is the climate change is the is the climate change story being covered differently in places like the New York Times, the Washington Post, traditional news organizations, and if so, how? Um, well, the the most marked thing is for so long we were covering these stories as projections, probabilities. Something that's going to happen in the future. 2100. Yeah, he touched on this a, a little bit. Climate models. Um, and that makes it really hard to wrap your head around. It also makes it really hard to apply the science and the science findings to stories. As that sort of contributed to this topic becoming political mm -hmm. um, and debating yes, no, it's happening, it's not happening, and, and litigating and relitigating whether or not climate change is happening. Now, um, in the last couple years, the story has very much become about what's happening now. What are we witnessing? Um, how is it affecting our lives today? How is it going to affect our lives next year, not you know, next generation? Um, that's also made applying and plugging in the science easier because the science you know, the science itself is not necessarily the story. It provides the tools that allow you to understand the story. Um, you know, what is happening, the science can kind of help you explain that. And that's a lot easier to do in the here and the now than talking about what might happen 10, 20 years from now. I, I should say, by the way, that we call this event, a, we're calling this event a roundtable, and we're really going to open it up to your questions, comments, probes, and probably sooner rather than later, so that we make this a, a, a very much a, a conversation. I'm just trying to tee up a few things. Lucy, I thought your presentation earlier with Now This was terrific. Thank you. And it's, it reminded me of something. I went up and I visited CBS News headquarters not too long ago. How many here uh, ever watched the CBS Evening News? OK, so plenty of hands go up. Anybody here watch CBSN, their online news feed? <laughs> Few. They don't market it very well. I told them that. It's obvious. <laughs> it's the future but, of television right, news, guys. But, 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 but CBS Evening News, their, typical, their demographic, their, the, the median age is 68 years old. CBSN is 38 years old. Right. They told me that the climate story doesn't sell on CBS Evening News, although they're doing more of it, but it's very big on CBSN because that demographic wants that coverage. Mm. What is the appetite for climate on with, with now this? And and what you talked a little bit about your yeah. analytics, but how, how how where is that coming from? I mean, I think it's huge, especially with the generation that's under twenty. That's like under twenty. Yeah, I mean, I think fourteen and fifteen year olds. Like, I get, I don't even really get recognized, but when I do get recognized, it's like fourteen and fifteen year olds. Really? Yeah. <laughs> but when I do get recognized. <laughs> um, but is saying, that legal for them to recognize? But you? like they're on they're on Snapchat. I think that for us, like our coverage, it's very like tactile. I'm like teaching people how to compost, and sort of like well, you're showing them how to throw straws away. Yeah, or pick up. Yeah, exactly. Or no, say no to the straw. Say and no I, to the straw. And I feel like sometimes there's a criticism that's like, well, that's not going to change policy, and like that's just one person. And my answer to that is that I think people want just like a first step that they can take and then opens their minds up to policy. So how do you cover the story? I mean, this is a complicated story. There's yeah. science, there's this, there's that. That's what you were just talking about. Are you doing that for your for your audience? Or is it more, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be kind of yeah. snarky here, is it more like entertainment news? Like, do this, do that. And I, I, I try to make it both. I think that like you can't have, you can't have just like the like, don't say no to a straw without any more depth and like trying to explain why. Like, plastic comes from oil and connecting those dots. Uh, but I don't feel like I'm going into the science of like CO2 in the atmosphere. I'm, I'm, I'm it's sort of implied that they know. But then I am also connecting a lot of dots. Like why composting is really great and being like it's good for plants. It returns nutrients to the soil. You're keeping stuff out of landfill and landfills cause methane. 
and like that, I go into that. Rajesh, you know? I want to ask you, you're, you're, you're at the UN Foundation now. Just tell everybody what the UN Foundation is if they don't know. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks very much for having me here. Um, uh, the UN Foundation is the UN's strategic partner. We're the best friend of the UN. We work to help it mobilize ideas, people, resources, all the help it needs to drive global progress and tackle urgent problems. And you're a, you're a former journalist. You were with the BBC. 21 where, years. Where did yeah. you serve with the BBC? Uh, in the UK, around the world, and five years in the US, including on the West Coast okay. as well. So give us your global perspective. What do you see as the difference between the way American media have covered mm -hmm. climate change and the way climate change is covered elsewhere? So there's two things to say, really. First of all, uh, having worked for the BBC, which is publicly funded uh, in the UK, means that uh, the, the organization is not so driven by only ratings. Obviously, the BBC needs to appeal to as many people as possible, but when you said climate change stories don't sell on the CBS Evening News, that's not a consideration for the BBC. And frankly, you know, it makes it much harder to do journalism correctly if you have the profit motive uh, uh, hanging over your head. That feels like an entirely different path. I, I will tell you something. <laughs> that, I will tell you something that, will, that I think will shock you because it shocked me. At a time when I was at CNN, I'd gone back to CNN as a special cor in a special correspondent role. I did that for five years, 05 to 09. And I was doing stories for a primetime broadcast. And the executive producer of that primetime broadcast told me flat out, we will not do climate change stories during this broadcast because they don't rate, meaning no rating. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I, really? So. Okay, so I, but I think actually what we're starting to see is that that's changing yeah. slightly. Uh, the New York Times has an environment desk. Yes, quite right. It's a story. But the New York Times has a really successful subscription model as well. And other organizations, other journalism organizations and news organizations, uh, media organizations, are being able to get to people with stories that matter about the issues that they care about. And climate change is absolutely one of them. The difference in the coverage, and this also is starting to change, uh, and we, you know, we, we've talked about it already, you talked about it, uh, Jeff, uh, is that the, the, the nature of what we're hearing in the media is different. In, you know, in the UK, there's, it's been a long time since uh, the media there was talking about whether climate change is happening. Mm -hmm. It's been a long time mm -hmm. since uh, the media there was talking about who's to blame. Right. That's just starting to happen in the media here. You know, fantastic <coughs> that it's finally happening. It needs to happen much faster. Hey, Jeff, faster you talked about the tobacco story. You were inside during the um, Bush quail administration, so you know how this works. Several years ago, during the Obama administration, the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, led the way and put a report together on climate and sustainability. And they were told by the administration, as a, it, was, it must have been uh, 2012 for the re-election, yeah. to sit on it. Things changed after 2012, okay, after but the my, re yeah. But my point was, they were told to sit on it. And they were told to sit on it because they said, if this is published, our opponents will use this against us. You're regulating, you're, su you're suppressing jobs, you're harming the economy, and it was the administration themselves who realized the, the saliency, the power of that. Doesn't that still exist? It, and doesn't that still affect both decision making and the coverage? It, it does and it doesn't. I'll tell two very quick stories. So in order to convince then President, on the t in the tobacco wars, that, 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 the, that the FDA could declare jurisdiction over cigarettes, we had a 10 minute meeting David, we knew the Dr. Tessa would only have a 10-minute meeting with President Clinton, and that all of his political forces were lined up against him. Every single one of Clinton's political advisors said, you cannot allow David Castro and the FDA to declare jurisdiction over cigarettes. It will cost us the re-election. Because all cost of Cost us the re-election? Yes. They said that? Yes, they said that. And they said that over and over to me and to, to David. They said, you, we're not going to let you do that. So we had, and so in order to defeat that, I actually went and met and, and co-opted all of the tobacco farming co-op directors in Kentucky and South Carolina and North Carolina to pull them away as a, and so to be able to prove that the tobacco industry w didn't have the muscle in those states to d and this wouldn't be the issue. We have the exact same problem with the climate issue and we had it with the Obama White House. It shifted after 2012. The political aides view this issue with fear not with what to do about it, but they view it with fear. They, so you had political advisors who were telling the president, even a Democratic president, you cannot take on this issue out of fear, out of fear that it will boom, blow up in their face. It was only, it only after, the, you know, we were eventually able to convince the Obama White House advisors, not only should you not fear this issue, this is a winning issue. Actually now, it, it's almost a wedge issue um, at this climate. point. Climate is, climate is a wedge issue. I mean, it, that's why you're seeing so many people on both sides of the aisle scrambling to try to figure out how to deal with this. Mm -hmm. Katie, what do you think is going to happen in, 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 in the coverage, in the political coverage of 2020 with this wedge issue? 
Um, I, people will continue to cover it more aggressively. I think, you think one it of will the for sure be covered more aggressively. Yeah, I think one of the responses to an administration that is still kind of in old school denial is that well, one, the denialism is dismissed, and two, there's more aggressive coverage. You know, for example, this week Trump says wind energy gives you cancer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So that's galvanized a noise, whole noise cancer, a whole bunch, bunch of, kind of cancer. Cancer. right? Noise a whole bunch of journalism yeah. or journalists to go out and you know prove him wrong and and say what wind energy actually is and you know so so I wouldn't listen so much to the noise um, in the debates as what's actually happening in the industries with investments and job trends. Mm. Um, that is where the truth of these of of these kind yeah. of. How, how are you, how, shifts are happening? Yeah, yeah. yeah. How are how is now this going to cover this in the election year? I mean, you think your your subject matters yeah. going to go way up? Are you going to? I mean, I think we're already covering it a lot. I think it's it's already always been one of our key tenants of what we cover, and we we have the data to back up that our audience cares so, so much about data? environmental. So what's your data? Can you share some of that data? Well, it's like we we can look right away at views and engagement, and then you can break it down by topics. So you can see views and engagement go up for climate. Yeah, change. and we know that environment and climate is one of the main things that people care about. One of the causes issues that people really care about of our viewers. It's like one of the top five issues. And so I just feel like for the younger generation, it's just taken for granted. Yeah. Like, it's like, duh. And yeah. here in the US. I, I, yeah, exactly. It's yeah. like, duh. Are, yeah. are you kidding me? Yeah. Yeah, our, our sister organization, The Better World Campaign, uh, which works to increase support for the UN in the US, did polling last year amongst um, young Americans, Gen Z and millennial, all 50 states, both declared Republicans and Democrats, or, you know, they don't know yet because they're too young. Um, the biggest issue for them was the environment. Yeah. The biggest issue. The biggest issue that they wanted their government to tackle was the environment. That's all 50 states. We just had the climate Bipartisan. strike. Bipartisan. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. The youth climate strike, I went to that, uh, and it was all- Anybody heard of the youth climate strike? Yeah. March 15th. Anybody so participate inspiring. in this? Yeah. Woo! Striking. So all of this shows something as well. I mean, this generation of young people, yeah. they're not only, I mean, this is settled science. There's no debate about it for them. But more than that, this is an activist generation. And that is actually, yeah. I think you probably know that through your audience, definitely. Right. But this is a generation that will do something about it. Not only the school strikes, but even small individual actions, which is why your videos, which right. is why you're recognized by right. those teenagers. <laughs> yes. Because they're learning from <laughs> you to get rid of plastic straws and to do yeah. composting. And I think one thing, uh, Jeff, that you talked about, the messages that you mm -hmm. talked about, I wrote them down. Please forgive me if I wrote them down. <laughs> I can barely read my own <laughs> scribble. Uh, embrace the haters. Yes. Right? Yeah, I love Mainstream that. the clean energy revolution, mm -hmm. right? Recognize victories. Win, win in your grasp. Yeah. Yeah. Right, okay. There's a fourth one, okay. I think, and that is that you can do something about it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right? The individual, how, how to link the individual to what is clearly a big, a, yeah, I couldn't agree more. The way that I, it's changing now. <laughs> sorry. No, go, I love it. Oh, I love it. I don't have to do anything. This issue, <laughs> this issue um, used to be so intangible. Yes, that's it's how so I feel big too. and so scary that yeah. it turned people off. I can't do anything about it, so what's the point? But increasingly, the news coverage, and also thanks to organizations, every organization yeah. around this, you know, this shoe, this, this, this circle, um, has been important in helping every birth, uh, individuals understand that actually you do make a difference. Yeah. Not only do we need everyone to make a difference in order to reach the goals of the Paris Agreement, but your, uh, Decisions as a consumer and your lifestyle decisions are actually the one of the best ways yeah. as well as voting to show policymakers the kind of policies that they so, should. So I, can I just very quickly double that because everybody gets two votes. You get a political vote and a consumer vote. You, we need to exercise both of them on this issue yeah. as loudly and as quickly. And I, well, I, I just want to say that last year at this event and so some of the, you who are here will remember it, we had a panel. Um, with Ted Roosevelt IV, Susan Eisenhower, and a guy by the name of Nick Aiken. Nick Aiken is president of AEP, American Electric Power. And here's what he said. He said, what happens in policy actually is not what concerns me most. What concerns me most is the demand from my consumers. Absolutely. And my consumers, yeah. and by his consumers, he meant his big power consumers, the Targets, the Googles, the gigantic media, uh, not media companies, gigantic power consumers, they were demanding the power from renewable sources. Okay, so that and and they are reflecting you. They are reflecting the yeah. pressure of their. So this right. this this is an incredible ripple. The effect. best case in point for that is when North Carolina, the Republican Party, foolishly tried to change the rules around 
their renewable portfolio standards. Google, Facebook, uh, and, and a couple of other com big, big consumers said, you change this, we're pulling all yeah. of our workers so out. It's challenge. becoming so mainstream, and I think, mm -hmm. uh, building off what you said, like, I think that we're at this tipping point where it's becoming tangible, and like, I actually have so much fear and shame and guilt around climate change and like my habits, and I'm just like, oh, this is like unapproachable. It's like a <laughs> wall in the future. I was just like, I can't think about it, I don't know. And then I think as soon as you become activated and you change your perspective that you can take actions to change, you become motivated and you become you become part of the solution. Mm -hmm. And I think it's like any big campaign, like you did the, the tobacco thing, uh, it's like any big moment of change, you can't imagine it happening until it happens. Correct. And that's why I think it's so important for people to like let go of their shame, let go of their fear because there's so much and just like start taking steps, educate yourself, get mm -hmm. connected to groups. Like yes. I think about climate change now and I think see it as an opportunity. There's so much innovation happening. And like I think beyond just keeping carbon in the ground, how do we draw carbon out of the atmosphere? What technologies do we use? How do we change agriculture? Mm -hmm. How do we invest in all these things? Like it's actually such an opportunity and then you can be like excited about it. Really it's the weird greatest thing. economic opportunity yeah. in the history so of the, the world. So one of the things one of the yeah. things we so. talk about here Amen. where we teach <laughs> at the School of Media and Public Affairs, we have journalism and mass communication or you can be here and you can major in political communication. And political communication studies and looks at what we call framing and agenda yeah. setting. Mm -hmm. How do you frame an issue? Is it framed around loss and sacrifice? Is it framed around opportunity? And it's not easy, you can't flip the switch. Right. But tobacco is a great example, the example you gave. So I'm, I'm interested as to how you see the frame, okay, the predominant frame, and I'm gonna start with you, Katie, because you're doing it at Science News, and has that changed? Well, the one thing I wanna say is all of us, yes, it has. Um, all of us are, we read these studies, we're looking at the future, we're all concerned, we're all pretty much on the same page about what we think, you know, generally should be happening. <laughs> A lot of talk about activism. The thing to remember is that as journalists, your jobs are storytelling, trends, you know, following trends, you're, you're not activists. Mm -hmm. And it's really important when you're framing a story and listening to sources wherever they are, that you keep that in mind. That so is that right for Chuck Todd to say, it's settled science, we're not gonna have climate yes. deniers on, you shouldn't, we're not gonna do that. Yes, I think, I mean. That was right? That the was science okay. is Wasn't definitely. Wasn't he taking a side? No, I mean, this has been, this has been basically, the, the consensus is so overwhelming behind that right. and, aspect and the of media the science. Gotten a lot of hits for false equivalency and all of that. Right. Kind of I mean, the thing, the thing that I'm you want to be careful of is the prescriptions, <laughs> you know, uh, advocates for certain act, action, um, mitigating action. There's a lot more coverage now around adaptation. Um, versus that, mitigation. So now this is in the science journals or broadly speaking? Kind of both, yeah. Adaptation, um, I mean, there's still a lot of coverage of, of just what's going on in science um, and trying to keep up with it. But in terms of, adapt we, we never really had stories or studies on adaptation a few year, until a few years ago. Well, some of the environmental community didn't want to do that because that sounded like you're giving up. Right, that you're giving up and you know. But the truth is we need to adapt now, so there's. We have to cope. Process. I mean, there are already countries that are coping. I, I did a story a couple of years ago about how climate migration is happening in yeah. droves already. Millions of people are moving across borders right now. Mm -hmm. um, that's not some pie in the sky thing that we have to worry about in 30 years. Like right now, they don't have legal representation under the UN yeah. as climate refugees. Yes. The UN needs to change. That's one of the takeaways. My bad. They need to change. We need to climate refugees. Can you do something actually, about that? Right? Yeah. I'll Some get board. on the phone. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I want to ask you. I want to ask you one more. Let's make this a jump ball, and you can all go for this, and then let's open it up to you. And there will be mics <laughs> wandering around. And I recognize it's late, and everybody wants to get moving. But I think this is. You know, I hope you'll chime in because I'm sure you've got opinions. Um, we're in an environment now where the media, by some, journalism is called um, fake, dishonest, mm -hmm. enemy of the people, mm. where people are told not to believe what may appear in a journal, that they're told that th this is coming from a hopelessly biased perspective. Uh, some of those guns are aimed at people in the universities and in science as well, that they're part of some kind of liberal thing. I totally hear what you're saying about how this story should be reported and how you're reporting and how you're reporting it. But is there a danger, especially as we go into a political season, that the media and the media's reporting of this in a funny way feeds the, the, that, that sort of counter narrative? How do, you, how do you walk that line between recognizing what's real and setting yourself up for you know, 
being accused of being uh, a partisan. I mean, I definitely feel like I already am accused of that. Like, I don't know. Like, so get over I it. mean, like, I am advocating mm -hmm. for stuff. Like, I feel like if you watch my videos, like, you know I have a perspective. And that's fine. And, and that's, like, kind of just been from the foundation of it. Um, but I also think that in the end of the day, we have to build something new, and we have to move forward, and we have to create a new paradigm, basically, on this planet. And if we're spending all day looking to the side and people who are mad, we're not going to be able to move so forward. So just ignore them, embrace them. Like, I'm at least in, that's the position that I'm in. I don't think that that should be every journalist, but like for me, that's my perspective. So there's a definite I, I, spectrum of yeah. serving the yeah. public. I mean, depending on who your public is, who yeah. your readership is, who your viewership is. So you have to adjust, you know. How do you in science news uh, reflect the doubters? Oh, we don't. Yeah. <laughs> we just, I mean, it's not. It's not taken seriously. And how do you reflect those who say this is oppressive regulation, that it's, it's actually, and there are some. Well, so, so, so Science News is very focused on the latest in research um, and development, scientific research and development. Uh, general media coverage, I mean, if you, if you want to embrace everyone, you know, all of us care about the same things, our health, our family, our pocketbooks. Yeah. Um, the story of climate change you know, it might not affect you in the way that you think it would listening to your politician, but maybe it's affecting your air quality like it is in China or yeah. India, or maybe your water quality because, you know, the, the types of energy that are being um, generated um, are, are polluting. So, so there are ways to talk to people um, about the topic from an angle that they care about deeply. And I wouldn't discount that care. Everybody, you know, the, the, it's, it's just about kind of rhetoric at yeah. some point. And you gotta get rid of the rhetoric and get down to the nitty gritty. Josh, what do you think? It's ex I totally agree, it's about the storytelling. It's about meeting people on the platforms where they are, on the channels where they are, with the language that they, that they use, mm. and uh, talking about the issues that they care about in their personal lives. And that's why there is much greater resonance for climate change as a media story now because it's tangible and it's happening yeah. right now. We still, and it's we're happening still, in people's still, lives in this country. We still can and need to relate it to people. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of the whole notion of trusted sources. So there's a lot of talk about agriculture and, the, and how much agriculture contributes to climate change and all the rest. But what people in the, in the ag industry have found is who are the trusted sources to speak about that? It's farmers. Mm -hmm. we, had a, we had a really interesting Planet Forward Salon a few years ago, and we had a farmer join us from Maryland. And he talked about the farm has been in the family for generations, and what they've seen over the generations is the rain has changed. And what used to be sl slower soaking rains mm -hmm. in the spring have more often become these kind of downpours. <coughs> With the sudden downpours, there's more runoff, there's more erosion, they lose topsoil. He's had to change the berming and the drainage of his farm. So he's telling a story, yeah. right? in a personal way. So that kind of narrative, exactly. I think, also is a way to Absolutely. go. Absolutely. I mean, I, yeah, the, the, I did a story many years ago um, in India. It was at a time when everybody was freaking out because India was burning more and more and more coal. Mm. Um, and there was a big push for solar. Um, OK, India burning a lot of coal, that's, that's kind of a snoozer. Um, the, the fact that many people didn't have energy, that's also a little bit boring. So I went and I found a village, and I found this woman who was getting a solar panel um, for the first time, and it meant she could see light. She had light at night. She could go to the bathroom and not be worried about tigers attacking her. Like for her, it wasn't about climate change. It wasn't about even the environment. It was about functionality and having energy and electricity and that that aspect. And that w telling that story allowed me, you know, to kind of pack on the context of India's energy situation, and then it made for a very, you know, kind of full story, but you know, again, it wasn't, I'm gonna go write a story about climate change yeah. in the villages. Yeah, and you know, this is, this is a brilliant woman. Um, did someone here say they were from Texas Tech University? Okay. Yeah, so I think she's teaching there, uh, Professor Catherine Hayhoe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You Catherine all, is you awesome. You all know her. Um, she's a climate scientist, uh, she's, a, she's a Christian, and she talks to faith communities about climate change mm. because she talks to them about the issues that they care about, and she makes such progress with yeah. people because she talks to them 
in a language they understand. That is she talks they about the, 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 as a blanket, CO2 as a blanket over the earth in a way that's really... And the, the language thing. matters. We, we talked to mayors a few years ago. And we said, how do you talk to your populations about mm -hmm. sustainability and especially your underserved population? And they said, actually, to a person, they said, we actually don't talk about sustainability. We'll talk about coming and doing an energy audit in your house and seeing where you're, where you're losing energy to help you save money. Yeah. We'll talk about planting trees on your street, not because it's an energy sink, but because it's going to yeah. grow and you'll have shade and it'll be a cooler street on a hot day. Yeah. You know, it's really interesting how you That's can so come important. at this. And as for, as for those of you who are being thinking about how you can communicate effectively and how you tell stories, the words you use, the language you use, how you frame this really, really, really and, matters. And to that point, my show is about sustainability and I don't even like to like use CO2 a lot and like I don't like to like do certain terminologies because I feel like it's going to turn people off. And so we'll just try to say it in a different way. It just is like a subtle thing. But I think people have such fatigue or they don't know what it is or they hear certain words and they shut down. And so it's how can you frame it in a different way that's just... Beware of jargon. Yeah. Beware of jargon. Eco-sensitive, yeah. biodiversity. That's a I mean, these, all, all these words, we're very familiar with them. We hear them all the time. In print and in journalism, they, they kind of, they sound a little bit... Uh, like pamphlety. Mm. Before we leave, I wanted. I also wanted to answer your the, your original charge. The question of this is that um, the beautiful thing about science, and which is what science does so well, scientists love to argue among themselves. I mean, they yeah. the <laughs> peer review process. For those of you who have not experienced the the joy of the peer review process, it is a blood sport. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so they will argue. I mean, to the you know ferociously. But what's happened with climate science is we know we know an awful lot about climate science. So when we say it's settled science, it doesn't mean that we still don't have questions. We still don't know if the jet stream is being altered in the Arctic, for instance. There's a raging scientific debate over that. But the science, the core climate science, it's, it's long settled. Yeah. And this has been one of, the one, of the, one, of the, one of the problems that we have reporting science, broadly speaking, mm -hmm. is that science is baked on and built on and presumes uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Journalism does not. does not. Politics. Politicians want to say, "I have the answer." But I will. But I will. I will this is this right. Is, so I'm just saying. I mean. Yeah, absolutely. We, we, but I, I believe it's also perfectly appropriate for journalists to be advocates for science, evidence, facts, and truth. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the flip side of that which is totally true. Journalists and scientists say nothing if it's not based on evidence. Mm -hmm. So as journalists, you might get further not focusing on a study's findings, right, because that, even that's a misnomer. Focus on the evidence they're presenting, mm -hmm. how the scientist is talking about and understanding the evidence. Um, because chances are, if you go out there and you duplicate, you know, and you look around, you might find some of that evidence that he's talking about or she's talking about. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, it, focus on the evidence, not on the findings, and that will get you away from, you know, goofing. Sometimes scientists get it wrong. Sometimes studies aren't so great. Um, one of the challenges we have at Science News is trying to figure out which studies to cover and which studies not to cover. And sometimes we'll cover a study, it looks like a great study. The next week something will come out and completely debunk it. <laughs> then the next week something will right. come out and you know. See that plays the right, and that, of course that plays right into the hands of those who want to say science. Yeah. Exactly. Or this scientist or that scientist has an agenda. Should we open it up to questions from the floor? I see hands up. Let's start right there. And again, as I've done in the past, I'll ask you if you can keep your questions short. We've got four brilliant people here. We'll get as many in as possible. Tell us again who you are and where you're from. <laughs> um, Ayana, I count um, five people from Visicordia. <laughs> okay, there are five. <laughs> um, so my question is, and I'll try to keep it brief. Um, since, the, since we started the conference, you guys have been telling us about story, um, like storytelling and how in the beginning we should more so communicate in trying to relate to somebody and stuff like that. But when we got on this topic, we, saw, we more so took an uh, aggressive approach. And when it comes to that aggressive approach, it's like um, I've been having conversations with a couple people at the conference, and they've been telling me that the aggressive approach is kind of not the way to go because it steers a lot of people away and it turns a lot of people um, like different so I'm kind of in this conversation I feel like the lines have kind of been a little bit blurred for me because it's like you, we want to do this aggressive approach but we also want to tell a story and be relatable and kind of stuff and yeah. stuff yeah. stuff like that so it's like how do we do both yeah I Can guess I take a quick one at that uh, first before you open it up my, my do I I agree with you and that's this is a tension in the issue um, but my, my daughter's the chief resident in pediatrics at UCSF Children's, and she's the one who can explain this to me. She, doctors, 
nobody delivers one or the other messages. You have to actually deliver the problem and then deliver the solution yeah. pretty much all at the same time. It's true for this issue as well. So we have to be both aggressive. We have, everybody needs to understand the truth where we are with this issue. And we need to be aggressive about that, but we also have to be compassionate and talk about the solutions and make it meaningful and impactful at the individual level. Um, I, think, I think both are needed, and, and, but you're, sometimes you hear discussions about one side or the other, but the truth is we, sh we need to be having very active discussions on both sides. Yeah, so. I agree with that. I, I would just agree with that 100%. I mean, I think in the producing that I do, it's definitely way more relatable and like really friendly and like anyone can jump in and feel like and engage with it. But I wouldn't, no one would care about it and want to change if they hadn't read the really scary article right. two days before. So I feel like I'm kind of providing an antidote to that, but you definitely need both in the ecosystem. And it's whatever you're called to as a storyteller. Right. Do you want to be the more doom and gloom? and give the tough medicine, mm -hmm. or do you want to be more of the uplifting positive? I think each person can make that choice for themselves. And you know, it, it can go all the way. We have yeah. D David Wallace Wells joined us. <laughs> oh boy. Uh, right? yeah, that is yeah. one scary book. We talked about sort of the doomsday scenario and doomsday storytelling, mm -hmm. right? right? And a lot of people think that that's quite effective and gets people's attention. Yeah. A lot of people think it's very counterproductive and unrealistic and maybe even irresponsible. Okay, this side of the room, in the back. Oh. Hi, how are you? My name is Liam. I'm from Middlebury College. I would I was wondering if you guys have if you guys have thought at all about whether or not social media has possibly created an, an aestheticized version of an environmentalist in a way that may be problematic in actually taking um, t taking kind of um, kind of taking taking it to the next level in the sense of not just communi communi communicating this to the younger generation in a way that people are like, oh, I believe with that, I, I believe in that, but actually um, translating that into some type of tangible policy change. I get that. I mean, that's like my, I operate in that space of social media. The idea that there's a lot of like signaling you can do, like I've got my reusable cup or like I'm like vegan or whatever. And like, I think that yes, that definitely exists. But I think the overall good that it's doing is that outweighs the people who might just be treating climate change as a superficial, like it's the cool thing to do to be bringing your cup to the store. By the way, I think all small actions do add up. And so why not make it normal to bring your bag or thing to the store? But I think also it's like, you do that and then what do you do next? Who are you voting for? What policy are you doing? And my only counter argument to you would be like, if you don't have people even caring about bringing a cup to the store and they don't care about single-use plastics, why are they going to care about climate policy? Right. Like, you have to meet people where they're at. And if that means something like that's it's now all of a sudden cool to be eating vegetarian on Fridays, then, like, great. I just want results. I don't really care. Mm -hmm. And if 10% of those people don't even go to the policy part and they still are bringing a reusable cup, great. The, they, aren't, they weren't going to be changed anyway. Yeah, I mean, so it's all good. It's all becoming part of culture, and it's great. You want them to jump in on the curve wherever they are, wherever yeah. they're ready to. And if it's literally that they're just going to switch the lights off when they leave a room, fine. <laughs> what we hope is that you'll tend to take the next step, yeah. and then the next step, and then the next yeah. step. Also be more receptive to messaging that comes in when they're doing that, yeah. when they're participating at some level, when they hear something that may be from a Mm -hmm. but, I, a, but I don't think there should be shaming in the community that like, oh, you're not bringing your steel container, like because yeah, then it's a privileged thing where it's like maybe you don't have access to that in your community or you don't have time to eat healthier. And I and I think that like there should be no shame, uh, and there should be no like signaling like, well, I'm more sustainable than you because like I've got my to go <laughs> cup. It's like that's not okay. <laughs> Does that happen? Yeah, you know, everything not. happens. Okay. Yeah. I would love to see mass competitions about who's more sustainable. <laughs> That'd I know. Be but, awesome. but I get, but also it's like, it's, it's an access and it's a privilege yeah. thing. Like some people live in Brooklyn and they can do, have access to all these amazing things and some people don't and that's fine. And the people who don't have access shouldn't be made to feel bad. And they shouldn't all move to Brooklyn. I mean, if they want. I see. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's go and stay in the back here. We'll move across the room. Um, you all talked a little bit about... Tell uh, everybody who you are. Oh, hi, I'm Vanessa. Um, I'm a correspondent for Swanee. Um, so you all talked about climate change in the context of uh, an opportunity for mass cultural technological innovation. And I was wondering if you all could highlight some new technologies or studies that you've heard of recently that have inspired hope or um, have made you feel like the, we are moving the planet forward in some capacity. So I, I can I can start because 
what you, we're starting to see the, just as, I'll just give one example. So when I was at the National Science Foundation, when, um, when, and I was able to secure $3 billion during the American Recovery Act for, and almost all of it went into green jobs. And the bi our, one of our big bets was to give a lot of money to study battery storage mm -hmm. combined to solar and wind power. We are now starting to see the fruits of, all of the, the, first it was basic science and then it became applied science. Right now, the battery, battery storage is on the cusp combined with wind and solar energy to change everything. It will, yeah. it will lower the cost for, it, it, it's, our, it's gonna beat out every single um, other energy source, the, the combination of that. But that's an example where you have to be smart about it. And we were lucky we had the resources to, to, to fund the basic science. And, but, and, so. and if I can, actually, that, that kind of thing, some of these technology and, and breakthroughs that are happening, these two are the stories now. Yeah. Where 10 yeah. or 15 years ago, these were kind of like fringe things and right. oh wow. But now now it's it, mainstream. And because yeah. it maps onto climate change and these are self these are sort of reinforcing yeah. narratives. Mm -hmm. You kind of have a double lead if you can, yeah. if I can use the old right AP style, you know. I, so yeah, I was gonna say I read the book Drawdown, which talks about like climate secret climate. No, oh, sorry. There are a hundred of them in Drawdown, so yeah. Yeah, there's a hundred solutions in Drawdown. If you're feeling uh, n sad about climate change, you should read that book because it made me feel much more motivated. And it's just about all the technologies that can not just like do renewable energy mm -hmm. where we're putting less carbon, but then carbon sequestration through like changing the way that we do agriculture. Um, I mean, there's a million different ways, I don't know. And it just helps you realize that there are solutions out there and I think unless you read about it, you don't know. All you're hearing is like, drive less, shower, short showers, and it's like this scarcity mentality that didn't resonate with me at all. So when you read something like Drawdown, you're like, oh, there's a million opportunities like the batteries. And mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I think 100 cities in America right now have committed to transition to 100% renewable energy. Mm -hmm. And a few years ago, before Trump got elected, it was 20. So they all are, everyone's getting motivated. And, and let me, again, a, a little piece of advice, something to write down for those of you who want to be communicators in this. Make it real, right? Find somebody real, and then turn it into a turn it into an economic issue, mm -hmm. all right? You yeah. can you can if you do the story, you can still go out in Washington here and find somebody driving a Crown Vic cab, <laughs> okay? And you can do the story of what that guy or woman is paying for gasoline for that hog of a of a vehicle, and then help them do the math on buying a Prius or some other kind of hybrid where they're going to go from 18 miles to the gallon to 50 around town. Not only will they save money on fuel, they'll save enough money to be able to make their car payment yeah. on a new car. I've done that, so I know that that was <laughs> kind of fun. Can, so I just, can I just add to that? Relate that story to people, yeah. Uh, yeah. What I love to kind of hear about is uh, not just the stories of kind of huge breakthroughs in battery yeah, technology, yeah. for example, uh, on a massive scale, but also kind of the small uh, examples as well that individual entrepreneurs are doing. And this is where I think there's real innovation going on. For example, you know, the idea of a, uh, a gym that's powered by people cycling on the stationary bikes. <laughs> and I did a story about that in Oregon 10 years ago, and I just saw it in my news feed recently. I don't <laughs> your video. <laughs> but it's a fantastic idea. Why not? And yeah. that's also, you know, that's just, just cool. to your there's point about the kind of scary stuff, it's yeah. not that at all. There's that, a whole brand of solutions based journalism yeah. Yeah. that's just well, that's starting what, out right now. And that's what Planet Forward is meant to be. What we, yeah. what we asked for first are what are the ideas that move the planet forward? There are, you know, and there are some, I wish I had my little cheat sheet card with me up here, but there are some rules of thumb if you, if, you know, Google solutions-based journalism, there's some really great organizations out there that, mm -hmm. that give you tips how best to do it, how not best to do, you know, or, or how, what to avoid, uh, pitfalls, um, you know. But all the major news organizations are now kind of in some shape or form adopting some solutions journalism. The New York Times is yeah. doing it, the BBC yeah. is doing it's it. To counter the doom and gloom. Well, yeah. it's not just that, it's actually also that uh, online, when they're, when they're doing solutions journalism, they are getting much greater engagement, engagement from their yeah. well, And there's actually news on that. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I also, I just love like your slide of the horse and buggy and then <laughs> 10 years later yeah. the cars. And I always, sorry, I always quote this article, the New York Times, and it was like the turn of the century. And it was like, New York is gonna be covered in horse manure. What are we gonna do? <laughs> We're gonna be drowning in horse manure. If this rate of population growth, like yeah. it's gonna be a huge issue. And then it's like, we got the car. Like yeah. nobody like, <laughs> it, it, so it's like, we are literally at the horse manure like crisis, crisis moment right, right now around I, climate change. I don't know, I, 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 I think we're shoveling plenty of shit these days. I just, so. all I, I just, <laughs> I just feel like when you think about climate change, like you, we've never lived through a big crisis. Like we've never lived through World War II. We've never lived through the AIDS epidemic, if you're like my age. And it's like, this is a societal global crisis. And we're, I think we're gonna figure out the solutions. It's just really scary because right now we don't know what they are yet. You're awesome. Thank you.
All right. <laughs> uh, in the back, then I'll come up, and then we'll move across, I promise. Hi, my name is Trish Schrank. I'm from Eckerd College, and my pr my question's primarily for Jeff, um, but really for all of you. I was just wondering, um, when you're talking about doing lobbying for like these green movements, um, how should you interact with these officials that really have the power to decide where the money is going and how to really start um, these initiatives? If you could just tell us a little bit. So that's a great question, and I'm gonna. Uh, I, I'm going to tell a story to try to answer that question. So my first job, I had a, a really thankless job when I was at the National Science Foundation when I first got started, which was to convince them to double the, I wanted to double NSF's budget for federal science funding and, and get the agency reauthorized. And every Republican on the Hill just w did not want to hear that message. They hated un academics because their view is that everybody, all professors at universities are liberal. The academia is liberal. Why should we give any more money to the National Science Foundation so that they can give even more money to scientists and academia who can then attack us? I tried to turn that around. The only way to answer that question was to tell very simple stories how federal science funding how would, would turn into massive innovation. So I told the Google story to probably 85 United States senators, including almost every Republican senator. And the Google story is this, that the first million dollars came from the NSF. And Sergey Brin was a graduate research fellow. And that incubated Google inside of Stanford University. They actually mapped the entire World Wide Web on Stanford's servers until Google Inc. could be born and then launched into the world and then, cha and then change everything and revolutionize. As soon as I was able to tell that very simple story, the, even the Republican senators said, oh, all right, I get it, OK, fine. That basically was that, it was almost, more, it was almost that. Did you get more funding? Yeah, we did. The American Competes Act, when it passed, passed 80, 89 to 11 in the United States Senate. Can you help me fundraise for Planet Forward? <laughs> <laughs> but I, so, but the answer, but the, the the answer is, and actually, um, where is Michelle? I mean, she's the best I've ever seen. In, in, um, is uh, the, um, the you have to speak to policymakers and politicians where they're where they are. So um, you have to you know most politicians only care about things that are relevant to their district. There are very very few policymakers or politicians who actually operate at the national level and care about the national level. AOC within one, their vote cycle. Within their vote cycle. So you actually have to speak to them. So one of the other things I did at NSF was I constantly brought in university presidents from their districts or their states to talk to them. So you have to match things that they care about, where they are, and, th and that's the simplest way. I, I do want to say, by the way, that we have a university president with us today, President Amberg, from SUNY Environmental Science and Forestry. So you've got your marching order now, <laughs> right? Hit the hill, see what you can do. <laughs> All right, we're working our way. We only have a few minutes, so let's, uh, let's do a couple more questions quickly. Did I see another hand up over here? Yeah, Paul. And then we'll come in this way. Two mics. I'm Paul Otteson from ESF. I'm interested in the power of goals. California going full renewable, National Geographic talking about the 30% protection goal, something I wish uh, E.O. Wilson's half earth could be. Uh, had the global political uh, uh, opportunity to, to realize something like that. Is, and then you think of something romantic, like let's put someone on the moon. It's mm -hmm. a pre-written story that we then live through to its end and we, we know how to measure and we've succeeded. W is there potential for that in climate change yet? I mean, I'm ready to watch Mauna Loa, and when that, that, uh, that rise tops out and the CO2 starts dropping, that's my <laughs> way of measuring the end of a, of a story. Can we pre-narratize climate change and know when we... Rajesh, what do, you, what do you think? Well, we have goals. I'm wearing the pin that represents <laughs> them right now. <laughs> does, anybody, does anybody know what this is? Yeah. Yeah. The Sustainable Development Goals. Yeah, so we have a blueprint for humanity. It's called the Sustainable Development Goals. Climate is included in a bunch of them, but climate underpins nearly every single one of them. And we have targets, and we have the Paris Agreement. We have goals. We know what to aim for. We know wh where we have to get to, and pretty much we know how to do it as well. We just need the political will. So yeah, I'm a big believer in goals. Mm -hmm. Do those goals help coverage? Do they, do they guide coverage? Or is that, you know, oh, they did their report, they got their goals, and... I want to say, sadly, no. Um, hmm. Sorry. No, um, that's fine. Yeah, I, I get that. You know, people. At the end of the day, people, which means your editors, um, want stories that are going to speak. You know, have impact and immediacy. So that means speaking to people's concerns about public health, economics, um, 
you know, which industry is going to be offering jobs 10 years from now, which is going to be laying off people. That is where you see what the future might be. Um, so I, I wouldn't worry too much about what a certain politician says on a certain day or, you know, even a policy that's passed. Look at the underpinnings, and, and nine times out of 10, that's money. Um, you know, investors are not stupid. They're not going to invest in, in non-money, they're, they're not investing right. in batteries because they're concerned about climate change. They're yeah. investing in batteries but because they're going to I will give you two so big true. goals very quickly. Two big goals, I, could, I actually agree with you. We need to see the end of the internal combustion engine mm -hmm. um, and we need to see the end of fossil fuel based energy consumption. So those are two very big yeah. goals. If we can actually turn our sights to both of those things, that will make an enormous difference. In I will spot. say one thing about coverage. So I, I agree with you. I don't think the goals drive coverage. But the goals do drive policy, and they certainly yes. drive yeah. policy they, makers, they and it's yes. a form of accountability. Yeah. So every year I do it. But I still don't think the governments are going to follow the goals unless they can see their money makers or vote winners. Um, yeah. But they are. I mean, more that's and more. Probably, they are that's more probably, more probably the case. We're down to a couple more minutes. More I'm going to go yeah. back and then up. And so let's do this. we got two more. <clears throat> Hi, my name's Roby. I'm from the uh, Odom School of Ecology at UGA. I'm reading the book Merchants of Doubt by uh, Oreskes and Conway, and they talk about how significant it is when scientists reach a consensus like they have with climate change, and also how the same people who started the doubt that tobacco smoke causes cancer <laughs> started the doubt about climate change. And they, they say that the IPCC panel historically was very conservative in their projections of, of climate change and, and climate warming. And they say that the reason for this is because they were afraid of seeming alarmist. Do you think, um, Mr. Nesbitt, that this is still an issue today? Are, uh, is, is the fear of seeming alarmist impacting the way that climate scientists um, communicate their research? Uh, I would say absolutely. By the way, for those of you who have not read Naomi's book, um, uh, it's a it's a brilliant book. So Naomi and I have been up on. We've actually been on panels together to talk. My book is Poison Tea. It's sort of a companion to Merchants of Doubt. Um, it's a brilliant book. It it's, explains how there are paid paid experts who cherry pick science data to yeah. to sow confusion around science or doubt about science. Um, and that it sort of that playbook carries across industry. It was true of the tobacco wars. It's now true in the climate wars. It's true in lots of other wars. Anti vaccines. Well. What? Anti-vaccines. Yeah, a That's how we got measles it's up it's yeah. right. basically the same yeah. playbook all the, all the way across. But the answer to your question is, it, it is actually true. The IPCC is still somewhat conservative, even now, even w in terms of their, the, you know, they don't, no one on that IPCC various panels will tell you that they're pretty much convinced that the worst scenario is the one that they feel is most likely to happen. They're not going to say that because they don't want to, you know, to, to, create chaos. So I would say the answer tr is, is probably true still yes. And the other problem for scientists, and I wrestled with this when I was at NSF, no scientist who you know, gets credit for being a public communicator. Um, there's only a risk for them when they mm. get out there and speak. So, part of, you know, so it's hard for scientists to both be aggressive in the public square, but even to be in the public square in the first place. So I would say yes, that's probably still true today. Uh, I do want to say, um, the scientists by, you know, by trade are, are, they talk in uncertainties, they talk in probabilities, they're never gonna come out and say this right. is true. Um, that said, they're much more aggressive in reaching out to journalists, in speaking with journalists, in telling the story, in, in helping to translate the science that they're doing. Um, a lot of them are going through their own training in communications talking. Um, when the national assessment came out last year and um, the administration on Thanksgiving tried yep, to bury right, it. Right. Um, for us, it was the scientists who were just, you know, ringing the bell. And it, mm -hmm. even even our reporters who were the writing non about... The non-federal scientists were... Right, yeah. Was, even the reporters who were writing about, you know, dinosaur fossils and nothing to do with, you know, Earth systems and, and climate change we're saying, hey, did you see the report? Making <laughs> sure that we, on the other end of the phone, were aware of this story that was happening. So I do, you know, I wouldn't get too frustrated with the scientists. They're doing the best that they can in the way that they are able. Um, and it's our job to understand how they talk um, in probabilities, in likelihoods, in, yeah. you know, and not be so hung up on a yes or no black we and have, white answer. We have mere moments 
Time for <laughs> one last question, and it goes to Jerry. Jerry? So there, there are so many things <laughs> I want to touch on, but uh, as Frank knows, I've spent a career as a regulatory lawyer trying to guilt legislators and regulators to force the utilities to buy a product, renewable energy, that they don't want. And we have, you've hit on this, Jeff and, and, and Lucy, there's the two things. There's, there's the politics and then there's the choice, the consumer behavior, the economics. I'm going to posture for everyone. We are over the inflection point. I've spent a career doing this and I'm now not practicing law. It's to enable corporate America to go green. And what's happened is it's the consumer, Lucy, who is driving corporate America. This came up this morning with Mars when she said it's a labor issue. It's a labor issue and it's an economic issue. This, we are over the inflection. I'm going to give everybody a lot of hope here. And I've spent <laughs> 40 years for real doing this. We are at the point where the consumer is speaking. And so those little things, those straws yeah. you don't use, the things that consumers do and the story, and I'm going to turn this into the question here, <laughs> but the story that we need to tell is what consumers are doing to pressure corporate America. But corporate America, in a humongous way that I've never seen, is now the driver. And politics yeah. and regulation always lags the market. We are at the inflection point. This is now an economic issue for companies. Yeah. It's Google. It's Microsoft. It's it's an electric vehicle conference that I'm preparing for in, in a couple weeks where one of the young people said, I quit my gym and joined a different one because the one I was at didn't have charging stations, and the one I just joined instead has a whole bank of charging stations. It's consumer yeah. behavior. That gym lost the membership. This other one gained it. It is, Google, it is Toyota who went to Kentucky and said, we'll build an assembly plant here, but only if we have green energy, and if we're not, we're not coming. You make the decision. You yeah. need to be called. Bless you, but we're not going to be here. Google, Apple, Microsoft. And your question. <laughs> question. Uh, but I'll say, and companies, companies. I like this. It's a great but, speech. But, but companies but that don't get that message will lose their social life. Big time. And, a whole and, and generation the election, of consumers. So, so the question, <laughs> so I was looking for a question here, too. No, is is, is <laughs> your, the effectiveness of telling the stories, Lucy, were on your level? Yeah. What, it is those little things. It is the yeah. consumer behavior. To Can we connect? what the consumers are doing, which is influencing corporate America, which in the end will influence policy. And so can we get there? And how do we get that path? I'm going to posture. I don't think we've, we've not gotten the climate change message across. I don't think we've gotten across the issue of how we enable consumers to vote with their dollars yeah. in their pocket and make a difference. I mean, I think that I think it's just a mindset thing, again, for people, like, the more that I work in this space, the more that I do see that connection, and I do feel empowered, but I don't know if the average everyday consumer does feel empowered with their choices, and I would just say you should feel empowered with your choices because it adds up. I mean, is that... Fair enough. To the question? Fair enough. You made me feel jazzed, so that you have some good facts. So <laughs> All right, you. last thing. Everybody yeah. gets, gets a one-liner here. Oh, God. We started, this, we started this talking about coverage and what coverage is likely to do. What do you expect... You know the 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 some of the the chief top climate change issues, stories, controversies, opportunities to be when we talk about the year and a half, two years ahead, going through the election. Jeff. Well, that's easy for me because I have a standing bet with about a dozen national political reporters that we will see national climate legislation become law in 2021. The American public will demand it. Nice. So. Gosh, in the political <laughs> cycle, um, <laughs> I, you know, I think, again, energy policy and air pollutants. Um, okay. I, I think the bigger story, to be honest, is water, um, but I don't think that's going to get a lot of traction in okay. the election. Uh, so I'm going to give a global perspective, if I may, uh, talking from the UN perspective. Uh, September, we'll see uh, during the UN General Assembly week uh, a major climate summit. That is the big climate moment of the year. Mm -hmm. And that is a time when we hope countries will come with concrete commitments and actions to actually help us make much more progress. And I think we're going to see that arc through, I hope we're going to see that arc through uh, next year as well. I think also, not just governments, we've talked about individual action. There's a huge upswell amongst states here in the US, states and cities through something called the U.S. Climate Alliance. 23 states have and signed up. we are up still in America's pledge. We are still in. Very big, yeah. and where we've bought, yes. 23 states have signed up to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement themselves. Mm -hmm. That's 51% of the population, 57% of U.S. GDP covered by those states. They've created right. millions of green jobs. And then on the individual action front as well, I want you all to write something down or remember something. 
go to actnow.bot. It's a, it's a bot. It'll take you to a website. There's a link there. It's a, it's a bot on Facebook Messenger that gives you a, a, a choice of 10 actions you can take and that you can log your actions and you can keep logging your actions every day. And this has been running for a couple of months and there's about 110,000 actions already. Wow. This is political power that's being born. Individual actions that are being uh, uh, aggregated to show political leaders at the climate summit in September, look what we're doing, what are you gonna do? So I'd love you all to kind of join that as well. Brilliant. One thing I'm obsessed with is regenerative agriculture. So I think that that's gonna become more mainstream, that concept. And that just like, that will become like people will be talking about it. And then I also think that this idea that Every, like it's not gonna be environmentalists care about the climate and the planet and like everybody else Everybody's gonna <laughs> think of themselves as environmentalists and as part of the planet because at the end of the day Like we are part of the planet mm -hmm. if you live on this planet You are allowed to care and I think that there's just gonna be this shift where everybody is gonna care Versus just like a few people who are like really into it uh, I, I, yeah. Let's hope so I'm gonna tell you what my prediction is I think from, because of everything you've heard from these folks and everything you've heard across the day the other part of the climate story and coverage that's going to change and it's going to put a lot of, it's going to be out there and it's going to be part of the politics is the United States of America sitting this one out. And is that acceptable? All right? You're right about corporations. Mm -hmm. You're right about the states and we're just in. But when, you, when that climate conference happens, what is the United States saying? What role is it playing? We've said we're not going to be part of the Paris Climate Accord. Where do we go? And that's what's going to come up in the presidential debates, and I think it's going to be a big part of the coverage going forward. Where does this country want to go, and does it want to lead from the top of its government? Hmm. Never mind its citizens and its corporations. But that's going to be a big question. I think it's going to be kicked around a lot, especially with the yeah. Green New Deal and Jay Inslee running saying climate is the number one issue. I just think that's going to be out there, so a lot the to look for. The world for. is better with America as a leader. Let's hope it leads from the front. <laughs> it's a better place to lead from the front, right? So, decent day. Right? You ready for some... <laughs>